Sorry, let me set myself up right here real quick. Make sure that I'm sounding good on the mic for Chris. I'm good? Okay. So, hello, everybody. It's good to see you all this morning. You guys remember last week, Akoni started in Acts 1, right? So, it's very important that we remember the things that he talked about because one of the things that he did say was that this is a story that Luke is telling us, right? He's taking us through his journey, right? All of the things that he recorded. He's writing this letter and he wants us to know it. And we have to be able to follow that by way of like conversation, right? Because you know if you jump into the middle of a conversation, chances are your context won't be right. You won't understand what it is that he's saying, the points that he's trying to make. You'll miss pieces. So a couple of the things that Akoni stressed, right? Jesus died. He, was ro- he rose from the dead, right? He was crucified, he rose from the dead, and then he appeared over a period of 40 days to all these people, right? And Nakoni said that a lot of us missed that, right? We, we, we missed the fact that this dead man was walking with these people for 40 days. It's amazing. It's an amazing truth to understand, to realize the fact that they all saw him die, all of these people, they saw him rise and then were with him just as a regular man. It's important that we realize that. It's important that we realize what Jesus told them, right? He told them to go and to wait and that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And he even said for the purpose of having power and being his witnesses, right? All these things are important as we continue on in the story. So we kind of left off at a cliffhanger at the end where another disciple was added and then that was it. That's where we left off, right? Right at the end when... Uh, after Peter had spoken his message, he read through and then appointed another apostle. So that brings us into Acts 2, right? And what I'm going to do that's a little bit different than what Akoni did is I'm going to read the whole chapter of Acts 2 right, right from the beginning. That way you guys have an idea of where we're going through the text as we go back and break it down. And hopefully it will help us follow it a little bit easier. So I'm going to start off reading. And then I'm going to pray, and then we'll go into it by verses. So I'm reading in the ESV in case you guys want to follow me along. If you have your phones, you can switch your translation to the ESV. If you don't have your phone, I'm going to be reading it. You can just pay attention to me. I'm a half-decent reader. I think we should be okay. So Acts 2 starts off. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were together in one place right, talking about everything that we had talked about in Acts 1. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in their own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, the residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, uh, Phygeria, I'm sorry, I'm butchering that. And Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongue the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea, And all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days will I pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood 
before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, and you will not let your Holy One see corruption. You have made this known to me, or you have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us today. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ and that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up and that we are all witnesses of. Therefore, being exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said, to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promises for you and for your children and all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. That's Acts 2. So now I'm going to pray and then we'll talk about it. God, help us. Help us all, Lord. I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what it is that you have spoken through your word for us. God, I pray that you would use me, an imperfect person, an unworthy person, to help explain the best I can what this is saying, God, so that we can all be in one accord like they were as we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, as we devote ourselves to this book. So God, I pray that you would help me even now and help my brothers and sisters that are hearing my voice. We thank you, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me take a sip of water. Now you guys know why I wanted to read that whole chapter. That thing is long. So we'll start from the beginning, right? When the day of Pentecost arrived, it's important because one of the markers that we got in Acts 1 was the fact that Jesus was among these people for 40 days, right? 40 days after Passover. Pentecost is a Jewish festival that would happen 50 days after Passover, right? Pentecost is, means 50. And the festival was considered, was called the Festival of Weeks or 
the festival of first fruits, right? The purpose of it was so that the Jews would bring the beginning of their harvest, their first fruits, their grain offering to God. And it's important that we know that because God does things on festival days on purpose, right? He instituted these Old Testament ceremonies and festivals all for purposes. We saw in, for example, we'll, we'll, do, we'll deal with the two that we're dealing with directly, Passover. We know that that was instituted in Exodus, right, for the blood over the door. We know the story. That's the same day that Jesus Christ died, the full fulfillment of that festival. Now we have Pentecost, which was given in Leviticus 22, 15, and 16, where he said, 50 days after this, we will have this festival to give the first fruits of our, of our labor, of what we have, back to God. And I find it to be fascinating that on the day of Pentecost, the day that the Jews would give their first fruits, is also the day that God sent the Holy Spirit and took his first fruits, right? 3,000 saved in one day. I find that to be fascinating because that was as if God took the first fruits of him getting, of him giving the Holy Spirit. And now, I'll be very clear, that's how I see it. That's my opinion. That's my interpretation. I just find it beautiful. I find it beautiful how it coincides. I feel like it's safe to say that God did that for that purpose. And that could just be me, but I, I, love, to, I love to put those things together the festival days, why God instituted certain days and did things that he did in that way. So 50 days, Pentecost, right? Suddenly there came a sound like a mighty rushing wind that filled the entire house where they were sitting and divided tongues as the fire appeared on them and rested on each one. I cannot imagine what that would look like. I can't imagine that I would even be comfortable right there. Like, I think I feel like I would be terrified if all of a sudden the house got really windy and things started to come down on me. I, I wouldn't know how to take that. I feel like if one of the things that I try to do is envision myself in scenarios that I'm reading, right? Because then it makes it more real to you. It makes it much more personal. So to imagine yourself, right? Say, you know, this, if you look around roughly, we got maybe 120 people, right? And people believe that that's how many people were in that room. Maybe it dwindled down to just the people that were there, the 11. Whatever the case may be, imagine us in this room, right? It would have been much smaller. And all of a sudden, a sound like rushing wind happens, and then tongues of fire come down on everybody. What would your perception be in that moment? What would you see? Like if, like, for example, right now I just caught eyes with Tony. If I was looking at Tony and tongues of fire came and rested on him, I would be like, oh, snap. Like, what, what does that even mean? Like, I would be nervous. It would, it would be weird to me. And probably Ephraim would think the same thing. Like, he's looking at me like, oh, my God, like, what is happening? And then it says that they all received the Spirit and started speaking in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I like word study. I like to look at Greek. I like to look at Hebrew. I think it's fascinating because our English language does not capture fully the words that the Greek and the Hebrew would. There's, for example, like five different Greek words for love, all meaning a different thing, but we just have love. So, you know, you cannot get the full meaning of what this is saying. And tongues in this, in this specific passage is one of those Greek words that has two meanings. It can mean tongue, as in tongue, that's in your mouth, or it can mean languages, right? So if we read this and say, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance, that sounds amazing. It's, it's really amazing. And the text supports that as we continue on, right? Because then it says, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout men from their every nation under heaven. That's a huge statement to say devout men from every nation under heaven, right? Because the mandate for us is to go out into every nation and preach the gospel, right? People believe that Jesus is not going to come back until every nation has been touched. Well, if we're going to take this text literally, it says devout men from every nation. They were all there, everyone represented, right? And it says, at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered which is a fancy word for confused, which is what I would be. 
I would be confused. They were all there confused. And it makes sense. Because they say, are not these who are speaking Galileans? That's like looking out into a crowd of all Spanish people, and they're speaking French and Italian and German and everything, everything, and being like, yo, aren't these all Puerto Ricans? You will be confused by that. Everyone should be confused by that. It says, they were astonished, and I would be too. How is it that we hear each of us in our native language? And then it goes on to list Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, the whole list. The whole list, right? Imagine that. Imagine we're in a group of people. We all speak different languages, but we have one language in common, at least, because we can talk to each other. Like right now, the the global language is English. Then it would have been Roman, right? Because Rome pretty much controlled the world during this point. So the trade language would be Roman, but then everybody would have their specific language from where they're from their region. And they're all hearing this in their own language. So some are hearing it in this language, some are hearing it in that language, and it's confusing because they all recognize it, but they don't understand why or how. How is this possible? How is this possible that you hear it like this, but I hear it like this, and he hears it like this, and then you got the clowns in the back. They're like, it's not amazing. They're just drunk. They don't, they don't understand anything. They're, it's, they're just drunk. But it is amazing. So right there, I'm picking up back up at verse 12. And they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said they are filled with new wine. And it's interesting that the Bible says that devout men from every nation were there to hear it, Right? And even within those devout men, some of them said, oh, they're just drunk. I find that fascinating. I don't know why it has that, but I, I just find it interesting. And I think it's something that we should think about because sometimes we perceive things differently, right? Everybody perceives things differently. Some, some of us could be hearing and they'll be like, oh, my, that's, that's of God. And other people could be hearing and be like, bro, this dude is way off. But it's interesting. Right? And we, we see it. So Peter said, right? I'm now back in 14. But Peter, standing up with the 11, lifted his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea. So he's now yelling, right? Men, listen to me. Let this be known to you and give ear to my word. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour. So obviously the word about these people getting drunk is going around. Peter heard it. He was one of the people that was there speaking in another language, probably. He was one of the people speaking in tongues. You would assume that from the text because it said they were all speaking in tongues. But he still heard it. He caught it. He caught that these people were accusing them of being drunk. So he addresses the claim. These people are not drunk. And he says, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. It's important to stop right there. What does that mean? What What is he really saying right there? He's making a claim. He's he's pulling at scripture, right? He knows it. He must know the scripture because he's saying, no, this is what I see, but it comes from here, right? He's, He's explaining to them. And it's important that he is because these are supposed to be devout men, supposed to be men of the scripture. He's saying, no, they're not drunk. This is what we see in Joel. And then he quotes it. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to Joel. And I'm going to read it from Job. So this is what, what, where Peter is quoting from right now is Joel 2, 8, or no, Joel 2, 28 through 32, if you want to write it down. And I suggest that you do write it down because it's good to familiarize yourself with going back and forth in your Bible to passages especially that are quoted so that you can get the context of the quote, right? Because Peter understands the context of the quote. He knows Joel. Some of us may not understand the context of the quote. If we don't know Joel, it's important that we do. 
I'm only going to read the quote, but I challenge you guys to go back and read this chapter of Joel and understand what Peter understood as he was saying this. So Joel 22 verse 28 says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on my male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that everyone who comes on mine, uh, who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That does sound a lot like what he said, right? Because he said, now, that, now I'm going back to Acts, tw- Acts uh, 2, 17. This is how Peter quoted that scripture. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. So if we realize that this man did not have a Bible in his hand, as he's saying this, that is amazing. That's a long portion of scripture that he quoted. And he wouldn't have had this to look at. It's not as if they were all in the room with their Bibles. Right? Because we see later on it says they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. We, can, we cannot, we, we have to understand that a lot of these men, the men that Jesus chose were lay men. They were just working men. Probably didn't even have copies of the Torah for themselves. They had to go to the temple they had to hear it, right? And we follow, you can follow that through church history. Uh, even early on in church history, most churches didn't have a Bible or had one, and somebody had to read it to them because it wasn't in their own language. So this understanding how much he knew is amazing, right? Because of the fact that Jesus said, When you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. Peter right here is showing that he's a witness, right? He's showing that there's some some power that's there that's working within him because he was able to remember this long portion of Scripture and be able to quote it and quote it properly in its right context. That's power. That's why we received the Holy Spirit. That's one of the reasons why we received the Holy Spirit, right? If I'm not mistaken, it definitely does say that Jesus had to open their minds, right? How did he do that? How does that look? How did he open their minds? Matter of fact, how is it that the Holy Spirit comes to help you remember? All these things are fascinating, right? And these are things that are overlooked. They're taken for granted, especially when we talk about receiving the Holy Spirit and for the purposes that we do it. Right? Because you see a lot of emphasis on gifts when you're talking about receiving the Holy Spirit. Right? Different things that happen and are are amazing, magnificent, right? Healings and speaking in tongues and all of these things. All of the gifts that people associate with receiving the Holy Spirit. But rarely do you ever hear a person say, because the Holy Spirit dwells in me, I know this book. Or I'm able to quote this book. I was having a conversation earlier today. This morning as I came in, that was very helpful to me, honestly. The question was, well, how do I do that? How do I talk about God? Well, first you know it, right? You have to read it. And then just look for your opportunity. That's what Peter did. He knew it, and then he saw his opportunity. These men are drunk. They're not drunk. Matter of fact, this is what we saw in Joel. Joel said this. He took his opportunity. And he stood up and quoted from the scriptures. So now, now I'm in Acts 22, where Peter starts talking for himself again. He says, men of Israel, hear these words. 
Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. Again, remember, he's talking to devout men. He's talking to people in Jerusalem, right? They would have all, well, we can assume that they were all there for Passover, that they would have came for the purpose of celebrating this festival, Passover, and they were remaining for the next festival that was 50 days after because if they were from all over the world, that was one long journey to take by foot, right? So why leave? And I feel that that's supported in the Old Testament when it would say part of your Sabbath, right? Part of what they considered to be their Sabbath was making time to go to these places, right? The Sabbath wasn't always rest in the Old Testament. A lot of times to, to be able to keep the Sabbath, they had to go on these long journeys to Jerusalem to do these festivals, to do these things. So we can, we can, it's safe to say that these men were there for this festival and remain for the next one. So they would have known that Jesus died. And, there's, and obviously he's saying that you know that all these signs and wonders were performed within your midst. In other words, you all saw this. You saw it. We're all witnesses. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It's also very important to understand the definite plan and foreknowledge of God because Jesus did not die by accident. He just didn't. He didn't die because people conspired against him. He didn't die because the Pharisees and Sadducees were very angry about what he was saying and they conspired and they were able to make a plan to kill him, which is what we see in the text, right? That's what, that's what happened. But Peter is saying, but that's not why it happened. It didn't just happen because these men wanted him dead. It happened because God planned it that way. He came and he knew. God raised him up. Right. That's enough for an amen. God raised him up. Losing, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. That's a big statement, and we all kind of, you know, resonate with that a little bit. We know that Jesus did not have to die, but why? Why is it important that it says that death could not hold him? Well, we understand from Genesis, very beginning, that the wages of sin is death, which is why we all die. We all die because we all sin. Not one sinless person. Jesus had no sin. Therefore, he owed no wage. He could not die. He would not die. He didn't owe it. That's why Jesus said, I lay down my life. Oh, no one takes it from me. I lay it down. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to pick it back up. And that's what he did. That's what he did. So let me come back. Right, crucified by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs for death because it was impossible to be held by it. And he goes back. He says, for David says concerning him. Now again, what is he doing? He's quoting, right? It's important. That means he knew something else. He didn't just spend his week memorizing that one Bible verse, and that's what he had in his pocket, and that's what he used. He didn't do that. He knew it. And he said, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Now, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to show you. This is fun. Let's go back and forth for me. So, he is quoting Psalm 16. That's 8 through 11. And I'm going to read it again so that we can see how close he is. Because to me, it's amazing. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand, 
I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells in security. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. Again, very, very close. And he did not have it in front of him. Right? The only reason I was able to turn to it so quickly was because I had a little bookmark right there. He would not have had that. If these book, even if he did have it, these would have been different scrolls that he would have been reading from. It would have took him some time. And he's in a crowd of people addressing a bunch of people who are accusing him of being drunk. Understand what's happening. This is amazing. So, he goes back. Now, brothers, may I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David. It's important. He said, remember, David said this. He reads the psalm, right? And it says, you will not allow me to see corruption. You will not allow me to go to Sheol, right? So he's saying, brothers, may I say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried in his tomb, is with us to this day. So he's saying, you, you all know David died, right? His tomb is there. We know where it is. Being therefore a prophet, and this is one of the points that Akoni brought up when he was talking about reading these scriptures and understanding that they were prophetic, right? Or everything to them would have been prophetic because they did not have the fulfillment of the scriptures like we have. To us, if you know, if you really astute, you if you really are studying, you can read Psalm and then read this, and there's no gap of space in between there. But for them, this was a gap of hundreds of years. So for them, it was prophetic. They did not know everything that David was talking about. I'm sure David didn't even know everything that he was talking about. And that's even supported in the text when it said that people would write and wonder who would be able to see these things. So David is writing prophetically. And Peter is acknowledging that when he says, look, David is dead. And he's in the grave. We know that this is not talking about David. So being there for a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on a throne, that's another quote. That's another quote from another psalm. Man, I'm going to pull it up too. Why not? If I'm not mistaken, that one is Psalm 132. Let me make sure. Ah, yep, there it is. 132.11, the Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he would not turn back. One of the sons of your, your body I will set on your throne. That's what he said, right? Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ. That's amazing. Because you know what happened? Christ's body, or Christ did not descend down into Sheol. And his body did not see corruption. Why? Because he was in the grave only for three days and then rose bodily. His body did not see corruption. Another fulfillment of prophecy. Right? So he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. He's explaining the text. He's explaining where he quoted from. It should be all of our goal to know a text, to be able to quote it, and then properly explain it. Right? Because he's not taking out one-liners here. He's not taking out his favorite Bible verse and using that for a situation. It's not what he's doing. He's taking big chunks of scripture and he's making them applicable, applying them. He's explaining them so that people can see, look, I'm not making this up. It's in the word. Guys, a devout man, know this word. I'm going to show it to you. This is what we see in the word, right? That's what he's saying. This Jesus, I'm back now, back in the text at 32. This Jesus, God rose up, 
and of that we are all witnesses. No questions. We're all witnesses. He doesn't say, you know, some of us. Some of us know that this happened. He's saying we all are witnesses. So, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing today. So now he's explaining their situation. After he pulled from the text and explained this was the promise, after he spoke about Jesus and said this is what David was talking about, now he's bringing it back to where they are right now in this moment. What you're seeing is this. You're seeing the fact that God kept his promise, another promise, because he mentioned promises already. You're seeing now that he's kept his promise. We are witnesses. We are bearing witness because the Holy Spirit has come upon us. Yes. So and then he goes back. Again, he goes back into Scripture. For David did not ascend into heaven, but he himself says, another quote, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Right? That's what, that's what God said. That's what the Father said to the Son. And we're going to pull that one up too. That's Psalms 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What is he talking about? He's talking about Jesus. None of us have to wonder where Jesus is right now. He's at the right hand of the Father until the Father makes all his enemies his footstool. That's it. And then when it's done, he's going to come. He's going to crack the sky. Coney is going to be excited. He's going to go like this, and he's going to take off. And I'm going to meet him up there, and I'm going to laugh because the boy is crazy. So, but he's talking about Jesus, right? He, he's, he, again, he's saying, like, look, this was prophesied. This is what we see in the scriptures. He's explaining it again. And then he goes back into himself. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified gospel presentation. He pointed out their sin. Twice. Yes, Joe. Yes. Twice. He keep, he's going to do that. Why? That's where we have to start. If you don't sin, you don't need a savior. He said, this is what the Bible says. This is what, that's why we would say it. This is what the Bible says. But he's saying, this is what the prophet says. This is what you're seeing. Understand what you're seeing. Understand what you're experiencing. This is not just something that you just happened upon. This is promises that are being kept. Now be aware of your sin. You crucified this man, right? Either directly or indirectly because of your sin. That's how we understand it, right? None of us were there to crucify Christ. but We all bear the burden of his crucifixion because we all carry sin. It is what it is. We crucified Christ. And that's what he says. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. What were they cut to the heart by? Amen. Yes. They were cut to the heart by truth. You know what they were cut to the heart by too? The word of God. It's not that he manufactured anything. He wasn't really trying to pull at their heartstrings like a lot of people are guilty of doing. Even us sometimes when you want to evangelize to family or and in any type of situation, some of the things that we can do to try to manipulate a person into coming to a proclamation of Christ, right? Saying that they are coming to Christ is we'll use things that we see, right? Peter did that. He used, he used his scenario. We could do the same thing. Be like, look, I know that you're going through this really bad. You know what I mean? It's a rough time, but lean on the Lord, bro. You, should, you know what you should do? You should pray and watch God take you out of that circumstance. Watch God do this or that, right? And that is true to a degree, but that's not why we need to come to Christ. We need to come to Christ because we've sinned. And we're under judgment. And without him, 
we perish, right? We all go to hell. There's two places that people go. They either go to heaven or they go to hell. If you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. And what he's saying is, look, you crucified this man. You're under judgment. People were cut to the core by that because they understood what he was saying. I'm sure that all of these people were not there hammering nails, right? Sure that not all of these men were calling for Jesus' crucifixion, right? Because then that would make it not applicable to some people. Like if you guys were, but they were not, then they could be like, well, I wasn't, so it's cool. What he's saying is, no, you're all guilty. You're all sinners. All of you crucified him. And they understood that, and they said, what should we do? And what do we do now? We understand that something needs to change. We understand. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm guilty. What do I do now? That is an open heart. That's an open heart. Not the person that's looking to get something. It's not really an open heart. It's the person looking for something. It just is what it is. We'll call it what it is. And that's cool. All of us are looking for something sometimes. Right? But an open heart says, I know that I'm guilty. I need to do something. Because I understand the consequence if I don't. Something has to happen. Peter says to them, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. How easy is that? Right? He didn't give them no long plan of, you know, well, if you start coming to church, right, and, you know, you, you find yourself some Christian fellowship and, you know, you start to work through your issues and all of that, and, you know, then you, they do an altar call and you go up and you get saved and then you're good. He said, he said, man, repent. All of you right now, repent. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you'll receive the Holy Spirit. That's not a lot of work. There's a lot of work later as you're repenting, right, as you're aware of your sinfulness. But he's saying, look, repent now, be baptized now. And you'll have forgiveness of your sins now. That's amazing. And, and he says, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the Holy Spirit. The same thing that we got that all of you are bewildered with, that you don't really understand, the thing that empowered us to speak in all of your languages, right? The fullness of God coming to dwell within you. You will have it too. Repent, be baptized. For the forgiveness of your sins, you'll have it. And then he goes on further, right? For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off and everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Now, the beginning part of that is the ending of Joel. What he quoted in the beginning for this promise, right? This is for you, for you. And then the ending part, I, I believe, I, this is an assumption from me, because Peter was walking so closely with Jesus, right? He was with Jesus everywhere he went. He heard Jesus teach. He heard him speak. So the more you're with somebody, the more you become like them, period, right? You pick up a group of friends, whatever slang they use, you use it. Whatever language they have, you speak it. Their mannerisms, you carry it. So he says, for the promises for you, for the children, and your children, and for all who are far off, and everyone whom the Lord God has called to himself. Where does he get that from? Because we say, everyone. He said, everyone who the Lord calls to themselves. That's important. It's important that we realize that because it says there were devout men there that did not recognize the miracle. Just missed it. They accused him of being drunk. Obviously, God had not called them to understand what was happening at that time. Maybe they did later. The text doesn't say. I'm not going to assume that. But in the moment, they didn't. Right? So everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. You know, in John 6, 37, 
going back because I love it. John 6, 37, this is Jesus talking. Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. To me, it sounds like what Peter is saying. To me, it sounds like, you know, whoever the Lord calls to himself. Jesus is saying, if the Father calls you to me, you'll be with me. I won't cast you out. You'll be mine. And then later on, in verse 44, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. So he does make a distinction. And I feel, again, this is me, I feel that's why that's in there. Peter would have understood that. He would have understood that. There's a distinction. So he, he spoke it as clearly and as truthfully as possible. Whoever the Lord calls. So, I'm picking back up in the text, verse 40. And with many other words, he bore witness, which was the purpose of receiving the Holy Spirit, right? That's, that's the one that Jesus said. You'll be my witnesses. He bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So obviously, he continued to point out their sin and exhorted them to save themselves. Save yourself. Then we go to verse 41. So those who received his words, not everyone's going to receive your words. He just exposited three portions of scripture. They saw a miracle right before their very own eyes. And it's still, the text still makes the distinction to say those who received his words. It's an amazing thing to think about. That goes to show you that no matter what you do, it doesn't matter. A miracle can happen right before somebody's eyes. They can still reject it. None of us should ever feel guilty as we present the gospel to a person and they reject it. Right? A lot of people judge their success on their evangelism or their success in their faith, how genuine their faith is by how many people are converted. It's not fair. It says, whoever the Lord calls, right? And it said, whoever received his words. People did not receive his words. Understand that. There are people in that group that didn't receive it. As amazing as that sounds. And if we're realistic with ourselves, if I'm realistic with myself, if I would have saw commotion and I would have been one of the people like, yo, these people are all drunk, nothing that Peter would have said would have stuck to me. I'm like, yo, all these dudes are crazy. I probably would have walked off before all of this even happened. Just saying. That's what I believe, right? That's what I believe about myself. I thank God that he has kept me. Thank God that he has allowed me to see this, but if I was just thinking logically, I would have walked away. Anyway, 41. So those who received his words were baptized, and there were added about that day, 3,000 souls. Again, Pentecost, ceremony of first fruits. Now, there's another story in the Old Testament where 3,000 people died because of their disobedience. I find that to be amazing. Same number. 3,000 perished, 3,000 saved. To me, that's dope. I love it. I think it's interesting. It may have no correlation. It could just be me reading into the text, but... Nevertheless, it's amazing. And that was the first fruits of people receiving baptism with the Holy Spirit, right? So they would be baptized in the Spirit. The Spirit came. They bore witness. And 3,000 souls were saved in that day. Amazing. And then we get to Oconee's favorite part. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and prayer. So after, after they were baptized and repented, they went and did some things, right? They went and devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to devote ourselves to the apostles' teachings. We have them right here. These are the apostles' teachings. That's it. That's what we got. The teachings of Jesus, the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. They did what we're trying to do. Devoted themselves to the book. And all came upon every soul. 
And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Again, amazing, right? Imagine all these people. Now, there's 3,000 souls that's all saved now. 3,000 people who now have the Spirit of God living within them. And it says, as signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. Right? That means not every single person did signs. Not every single person did wonders. Not every single person did anything except for devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, right? They all had the Spirit. That's important. Verse 45 continues. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That's a miracle in itself, right? Imagine if somebody was to be like, yo, bro, I need something in my house. Can you sell your TV for me? So that I can, I, mean, I know you could get like 300 for that, John, and I need that, 300. So if you just sell your TV, bro, I won't have this need. You look at that person like, boy, you're crazy. I'm not selling my TV, man. I'll see what I can give you. Though. I got like a dub in my, my pocket. I got, I got you. That's a miracle, that's only done by somebody who is with the Spirit dwelling in them, right? They, they, didn't, they weren't attached to their things anymore. Why? Because something happened to them. Amen. Something happened. They were changed. It wasn't the same people. The Spirit of God came to dwell in them. They were willing to give up everything here. But you need something? Bro, I'm going to sell this. Later on in Acts, people were selling houses, fields, and all these crazy things. But anyway, they were selling their needs. They were selling their belongings and distributing them to those who had needs. And day by day, attending the temple together. That's, a, that's every day. That's a, long, that's a lot of days. And I wonder if I would be as devout to do that. And sometimes I don't want to come to Wednesday. But I come, though. And God meets me because I do it in obedience, right? I come, and I'm glad that I come. But I'm just imagining, imagine if, like, one of us in the leadership was like, all right, y'all, we're going to start coming to church every day. Right, you see, people start laughing. I didn't even finish the sentence yet. Everybody's like, yo, he crazy. No, you know why he's coming out here every day? Ah, oh, job. These people got jobs, too. They had, to, they had to work, right? They had to sustain families. You would have imagined that they had, like, animals to take care of, children to take care of, business to attend to, so that... They could live. They couldn't go to the supermarket and buy food for a week, or two weeks. But they came, though. That's a miracle. They were breaking bread in their homes. That's another one. Because there's not one person in this room that will invite all, everybody that's in here today into their house right now. Right? Some people that you just don't know. Remember, we're, we're all here, though. And I, I would recognize your face if I saw you out. But you might not invite me to your house, though. Right? I'm just saying. So they were breaking bread in each other's homes. And they received their food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. That's another miracle. That's another miracle. They had favor with all the people, not just the Jews, or what we would call Christians, the people that believed, have favor with all people. We as Christians do not have favor with all people. I just want you guys to know that. We don't have favor with all people. Something different was happening here. That they have favor with all people is probably because of their giving hearts. Probably because of their kindness. Probably because of the fact that they were not afraid to invite people into their home. That they were always together. Imagine seeing that from the outside. Like, yo, these people be there every day. What the heck do they be doing in there? I'm going to go in there. I'm going to see. And then to walk in and to see people loving each other, right, and sharing meals and handing out money or whatever the case may be, you would want to stay there too. This would. That would. That would gain your favor, Right? Even if, even if you walked in and you needed something and they did not know you and they were like, oh, you know, we haven't seen you here before like our ushers do. 
nice to meet you, you know, new face, what's your name? Oh, yeah? Okay. And they're watching. They're, they're getting to know people because this guy's new now. They're starting conversation. Yeah, man, I came because of whatever. I saw you guys. Or what? Well, do you need anything? Yeah, I need, I mean, I'm hungry. All right. We'll go sit at the table. We'll go eat. You would gain favor with people too. This is a beautiful picture. It's all miraculous. None of it can happen without the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in a person. We cannot manufacture these things. We can't make ourselves do them. No one can. Many people try. They try and do as best as they can, but it's hard. It's hard to love people. That's why it's a command. So they, they praise God, have favor with all people, and then the last piece. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. It's easy to imagine that if you have favor with all people that the Lord would add to your number day by day, right? Because people would be coming, seeing, having their needs met, and they would want what you guys have. And we would add to our number day by day if that's how we live. And there are people that live that way, even now. People, you know, we went to the, to the boardwalk yesterday. We got hit with like three different types of evangelists out there. Some not so good, some all right. But people were doing it, though. You know, they went out, they engaged us in conversation, you know, and we should be doing that. And look for opportunities. Why? Because if we don't never take an opportunity, then we have no opportunity to add to our number day by day. Right? We either do it or we don't. We see the fruit of it or we won't. But it's my piece from Acts 2. Again, leaving off on a cliffhanger. That's why it's so fun to go ahead and keep reading, right? Because now it's like, okay, so what happens after they add to their number day by day? That's what I want to know. And I hope you guys want to know too. I hope that you continue, right? Read it again or continue on. Be prepared for next week. Right? Read it. Hear it explained. And, and then as you do that, see if it matches with what you thought. Right? Or see if it doesn't. Talk to the person. Talk to whoever spoke, you know? Engage each other. If you heard something that I said that you might not see in the text, talk to me. I'm here. I'm a person. You know what I mean? I'm up here, but I don't, I'm not, I don't feel at all like worthy to be up here. I should, I should be out there with y'all. I just read this book. It's what I see that God says. I'm just telling it to you how I would tell it to a Coney if we eat dinner together or even eat from, you know what I mean? We do this. Talk about these things. Talk to me. But read it. Read it. I'm going to pray for us. God, 